from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It's a program that has several different elements to it, but I have the pleasure of being able to introduce you to uh, two gentlemen who are the keys to the Library of Congress's recent uh, efforts uh, to re raise the national awareness of literacy in our country. Uh, the Center for the Book, which I head, uh, promotes books, reading, literacy, and libraries nationally and internationally on behalf of the library. Uh, and we have a direct connection with the Book Festival. State affiliates of the Library of Congress today are in the pavilion of the states. And if you are from another state and would like to learn about what's going on in your state, uh, please visit the pavilion of the states. Uh, the Center for the Book also administers the Library of Congress's Young Reader Center and its Poetry and Literature Center, which is home to the U.S. Poet Laureate. As I mentioned, we play an important role in the National Book Festival, coordinating the program of authors who are with us today. But of most immediate relevance for today, uh, we administer the Library of Congress Literacy Awards. Uh, the awards will be announced uh, in a few minutes. With me on stage today is the co-founder of the National Book Festival, Dr. James Billington, the Librarian of Congress. Dr. Billington and then First Lady Laura Bush established the Book Festival in 2001, and this is our 14th year. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Billington has been Librarian of Congress since 1987, guiding our institution into the modern age. Uh, and he's done so with his wonderful vision of extraordinary collections throughout the world being brought to the Library of Congress and being demonstrated in many cases on the Library of Congress's website. Our National Digital Library and our World Digital Library were created by Dr. Billington, and they have become models for institutions worldwide. Above all, however, Dr. Billington is someone who believes in the culture of books and reading, and that is what brings him together with the program and with our sponsor, our wonderful sponsor, who Dr. Billington will now introduce. I call on Dr. James Billington, the 13th Librarian of Congress. Thank you very much, John, and it is a pleasure to be with you today. This is an important event, important moment, really, and day for the Library of Congress and its historic mission to promote reading, literacy, and lifelong learning through its programs. That's lifelong learning has increasingly been the special new emphasis that we want to bring to everything we do. Now, the Library of Congress Literacy Awards were instituted and founded in 2013 by David Rubenstein, the major donor to the National Book Festival, and other Library of Congress programs, as well as the sole supporter of these awards uh, to promote literacy and reading as the gateway to a successful and fulfilling life in our increasingly knowledge-dependent world, a world in which we help to invent and we need to perpetuate at all levels. And this is a particularly thankful thing that we feel to David Rubenstein's vision and generosity. Our National Book Festival and now these literacy awards uh, are on secure footing, enabling the library to recognize the outstanding work of literacy organizations both here and abroad and to call attention to best practices in promoting literacy, promoting it and highlighting the work of innovative progress exemplified by our winners whom we will announce today here and what they are doing to open the gates to lifelong learning. David Rubenstein believes passionately that literacy is critical to successful life. He's demonstrated that commitment repeatedly uh, for many years now in many ways and most recently through his association with the Library of Congress and with his support for other institutions. So, Thank you, David Rubenstein, for making this day possible and this vision a reality. 
So, it is my pleasure to introduce the founder and CEO of the Carlisle Group, in addition to being co-chairman of the National Book Festival, David's passion for literacy has made possible these literacy awards, and we are grateful for his con continued collaboration and his sponsorship of important projects here at the library. So, please welcome, as you already have, but please again, David Rubenstein. Jim, thank you very much for those kind, overly generous words, and thank you for what you've done as the Librarian of Congress. Uh, since you were appointed in 1987 by President Reagan, you've really transformed the Library of Congress and really opened it up to people all over the world, and I think this book festival is a testament to the kind of things that you've done, so thank you very much for that. And John, thank you for what you're doing to, uh, with the Center for Book and um, all the things you're doing to help the library as well. Let me just briefly say why I care about literacy. Um, I didn't come from a uh, family where my parents were college educated or they didn't graduate from high school either, uh, but they always told me that one way to get ahead in life was by reading. And so they always made certain that as soon as I could have a library card when I was uh, in the first grade, they, I could take out the maximum number of books the library in Baltimore allowed me to take out, and I did, and I read them in one day, and I couldn't have to wait a week to get another uh, round of 12 books. But I always thought that reading was a way to open up one's... Um, uh, imagination and one way to advance uh, in, in civilization. And it's a sad situation today that as advanced as our country is and as wealthy as it is, about 12% of the adults in our country are illiterate, totally illiterate. And about 20% are functionally illiterate, which means they can read a little bit but really can't uh, do very much that's going to help them advance their careers. People that don't uh, read are not going to earn as much money. They're not going to be able to have as many things for their family as they might want. They're not going to be able to really get as much out of life as they should be able to get. And so what we need to do is really promote the idea that if you're going to succeed in life, you're going to make something of yourself, you're going to have a much better life, an enjoyable life, and you open your eyes to what, what uh, civilization has created, you have to learn how to read. Now, you don't have to learn how to read as well as Jim Billington, perhaps. You don't have to be an author. You don't have to be a, a scholar, but you have to learn how to read. And so we need to do a much better job of promoting that idea throughout the country and throughout the world. Those statistics that I gave in the United States, they are much worse around the rest of the world. The percentage of illiteracy around the world is much higher than the United States, and that's a sad situation. So um, Jim Billington and I thought it would be a good idea if the Library of Congress would put its... Um, imprimatur behind the idea of having literacy awards, not because these awards themselves are going to change the situation and the sad statistics that I just gave, but because the, putting the Library of Congress behind the, the uh, effort to really promote literacy, I think, gives it much greater credibility. And so when these awards are given and the money is given out, those organizations that benefit will do something more than maybe they would have otherwise done, but the word will go forth that others can win these awards, and hopefully, in our small way, we can promote the idea that literacy is an extremely important thing, and I also want to emphasize one final point. Illiteracy is a very important uh, problem we have, and it's been with us for a while, and it's actually getting worse in some respects. But illiteracy is a big problem as well. Illiteracy means people know how to read, but they don't read. 30% of the people who graduate from college in the United States never read another book. Now, they may not have read a book to get through the college degree, but, but they don't read another book. Um, about half the families in the United States have not bought a book in the last five years, online or going to a bookstore. And that's a sad situation. There's are people who have the ability to read, but they just choose not to do so. And the, what we really want to emphasize as well in terms of reading is reading books. Reading is important, and everybody should learn how to read, but reading of books is extremely important because books tell you so much more than you can get out of a tweet or out of an email or some other kind of uh, communication. So I hope this book festival is used, among other things, to promote to young people particularly the idea that they should read, but read books, because books will change their lives and books will make them better human beings. Thank you. Okay, so we have three awards um, we're going to give. The first award is called the American Prize. It's $50,000. It goes to SMART. Start Making a Reader Today, uh, which is based in Portland, Oregon. 
It's a program of the Oregon Children's Foundation. SMART is presented by, represented by Communications Director Jessica Corcoran. She is here. Okay, this one is up. Right. Now, this doesn't look like $50,000, but eventually it will be. Hello, thank you so much. I'm so honored to accept this award on behalf of SMART, which stands for Start Making a Reader Today. Um, in about a few short weeks, SMART will start its 23rd year of service, engaging Oregon communities to empower their kids through books and reading. We do this by pairing adult volunteers with kids in pre-K through third grade in low-income public schools across Oregon. Over the course of our history, we've engaged 113,000 volunteers to read with 170,000 children in need of reading support and one-on-one -on -one attention. We've also given these kids over two million books to take home and keep for their very own. And this award will help us tremendously as a validation of our work and will help us continue to build upon and improve our work to bring the joy of reading and lifelong learning to Oregon kids. Thank you very much. Okay. Our next award is the International Prize of $50,000. The award goes to the Mother Children Mother Child Education Fund of Turkey. Here to accept the award is C. Lincoln McCurdy, President of the Turkish Coalition of America. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of, um, of the Mo Mother Child Educational Foundation, known as Achev in Turkish, um, I thank you for this prestige prestigious award. And um, the president of Achev, uh, Gerkshan Erzian, and the CEO, Ayla Gerksel, also convey their deep appreciation. Achev was established in Turkey in the 1990s. Its belief is to make sure that there's equal opportunity in education for everyone. Its programs have had a positive impact affecting over 140,000 people throughout Turkey. So it's been a wonderful cause. It's been one of the leading NGOs in Turkey. Again, thank you very much for this prestigious award. The last award um, is the Rubenstein Prize. I guess they named it after me, and or, or somebody uh, named Rubenstein, um, for $150,000. It goes to Room to Read, a San Francisco-based organization that primarily serves Africa and Southeast Asia. Accepting the award is Dr. Corey Heyman, Chief Program Officer. Thank you so much. Um, we are so honored at Room to Read to be the recipient of this year's uh, Ruben, uh, Rubenstein uh, Award uh, for, for literacy. Um, this is a, a testament to Room to Read's commitment to global literacy and support for uh, gender equality around the world. Uh, our organization has been working for the last 15 years to support nearly 10 million children to receive access to quality education through establishing libraries, uh, creating storybooks, and promoting girls to be able to complete high school with the skills to negotiate key life decisions. Um, we will be able to use this award and its, um, its support and its momentum be able to continue to promote um, our, our programming and our ability to serve, to serve more children 
uh, more quickly in being able to um, become lifelong independent readers. Thank you so much. Let me fill in the picture a little for you. The actual uh, award check, of course, as Mr. Rubenstein said, is uh, will be forthcoming. But on October the 8th at the Library of Congress, there will be a public program at which time we will learn more not only about the three or winning organizations, they will give presentations, but we also will be honoring other organizations that received recognition for best practices. Uh, as Mr. Rubenstein talked about, we're trying to raise the general awareness of the problem of literacy, and another way to do it is to recognize not just the award winners, but those that uh, have illustrated through practices that can be uh, used by other organizations around the world uh, in the fight against illiteracy. So this is the second year of the program, and it's also an appropriate place to uh, recognize, I think, uh, the woman who is working with me on the Library of Congress literacy programs, uh, Jillian Davis, my assistant for the Literacy Awards program. Jill, would you stand for just a moment? Part two of our program is going to be actual uh, examples of kinds of youth literacy programs that the Center for the Book and the Library of Congress promotes. Uh, and we wanted to uh, recognize a different kind of winners, uh, different kinds of, of programs. And we're going to start actually with a special guest who is a writer who is appearing at the National Book Festival. Uh, Raina Tellemeyer, who is an author and illustrator, and she's a cartoonist. Uh, her graphic novels, Smile and Drama, are both number one New York Times bestsellers. Smile, her autobiographical account of her childhood dental drama, is a Boston Globe Horn winner and an Eisner Award winner for the best publication for teens. Uh, Drama won the 2013 Stonewall Book Award honor from the American Library Association. Uh, she also has adapted and illustrated four graphic versions of Anne Martin's Babysitter's Club series. Her second autobiographical graphic novel, Sisters, A Companion to Smile, gives readers an inside view of uh, Telemeyer's life growing up and focuses on her relationship with her younger sister. She is a very strong advocate of literacy and the example of the kind of writer who has an interest in literacy that we are happy to support and have as a guest at the National Book Festival. Uh, Raina, can I turn it over to you? Hello, it's on, hooray. And I don't even get to stand at the podium because I need to be able to see my visuals so that I can talk about myself properly. Um, thank you for the introduction and congratulations to everybody who's here today to pick up an award. Congratulations to the organizations that have been um, honored this year. It's, it's really nice to be in a room in a festival like this one um, among people that love to read and that love books. Um, I just want to talk about some of my favorite books. And most of these came from my elementary school days when I was learning to read and I was learning about the kinds of books that I liked. And I gravitated mostly towards uh, reality-based books, whether it was realistic fiction or memoir like Little House on the Prairie. Um, and a little bit of fantasy was always a nice touch. I love Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nam. That's still my favorite book to this day. Um, and Roald Dahl's work always spoke to me as well. So I was a reader first. I was always a reader, and then I discovered comics. <laughs> and I discovered these in the newspaper when I was about nine years old. Calvin and Hobbes, the first one that just leapt off the page and grabbed me by the throat and said, you must love comics. Um, anybody here never read Calvin and Hobbes before? I am so happy not to see a hand in the air. This is great, you guys are my people, I love this. Um, and so my dad saw that I liked reading comic strips. I liked Calvin and Hobbes, I liked For Better or For Worse, I liked Foxtrot. And he decided to hand me this graphic novel titled Barefoot Gen, uh, subtitle A Cartoon Story of Hiroshima. 
that's, that's going to go well, right? Raina likes cartoons, and so she's going to love this book. Um, it's actually a slightly fictionalized memoir of Keiji Nakazawa, who's an artist who lived through the atomic bombing of his hometown, Hiroshima, when he was six years old. So Barefoot Gen tells the story of uh, a boy named Gen and his family, and they're growing up in Japan in wartime. And it's, it's lighthearted and also sort of heavy at the same time, but you get to know the family, and you get to know the kids, and they're you know, not unlike Calvin and Hobbes. They like to play, they like to sing, they like to dance. However, at the end of the first volume of this story, the bomb falls, and half the characters in the story get killed in the process. And I did not see that coming. I thought comics were fun. I thought graphic novels were supposed to make you laugh. Um, and this one gutted me, and I cried for about four days and blamed my dad. It was his fault for giving me this book to read and, you know, sharing with me the atrocities of the world. But once I was done with that emotional outpouring, I felt like, you know what? Comics are an incredibly powerful medium, and they can make you feel just as many emotions as uh, books without pictures. So it was just a great lesson for me to learn. Um, and I started making my own comics around that time. When I was about 11 years old, I started trying to write comics. Um, and then the more I drew them, the more I realized I just like telling stories about my own life. So I started kind of keeping a diary in comics format. And it wasn't something I showed to people because it was my diary. It was embarrassing. It was about the boys I had crushes on and stuff. But um, it was good practice for me. I, I did this almost every single day. And as I got to be a little bit older, I started to realize maybe people will want to look at these besides just me and I should stop, you know, burning them once I'm done writing them. So I started writing short stories about my life for other people to read. And I self-published these as mini-comics. That means I would just go to Kinko's and put my stuff on the copy machine and then Xerox them, fold them into little books. And that was how I started sharing my stories with the world. And eventually, Scholastic was gracious enough to say that they wanted to work with me. Um, and now this is my job. Now this is what I do full time. It's really awesome. Um, Smile was indeed a story about my dental drama. Um, I had a really bad accident when I was 11. I tripped and fell and knocked out my two front permanent teeth and then had to spend the rest of middle school and all of high school without them. So you can imagine being an 11-year-old girl is hard anyway, but doing it without your two front teeth is even harder. So um, I decided to sort of take that experience and put it into a story, um, and it ended up being something that a lot of other people could relate to, which really surprised me. I thought it was this unique and horrible experience that I had to deal with by myself. Now that it's a story, other people can share it. Other people can tell me that they relate to the story, which is incredible. Um, I love showing this picture because people always ask me, is the story true? Is this real? Did this really happen? I'm like, yes, I wore acid wash jeans and scrunchies. I know. It was the 90s. What do you want? Um, so, <laughs> and my newest book, Sisters, is like Smile in that it is a true story. This one focuses on a road trip that I took when I was 14. It was to visit cousins in Colorado. Um, and so the framing device is the road trip, but it really is an excuse to examine my relationship with my younger sister. Um, she and I have many things in common and many things not in common. Um, you, you find out that we're both artists. You meet all of our pets that eventually die in weird ways. Um, my sister's snake got into the car that the road trip takes place on. So you can, you can fill in the details in your mind or you can read them in the story. Um, so being a writer has really opened up a lot of doors for me. Being a reader opened up the door to being a writer. And being a writer has let me connect with people all over the world. I love getting letters from kids. I get emails. Um, I get to travel all over the world. I get to be here today with young writers, which is really inspiring for me. Um, as, as a person who wants to keep making stories. So I hope it's inspiring for you guys, too, just to be here today at the National Book Festival. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you, Raina. Your enthusiasm is wonderful. We now have another part of the program. Uh, we are talking about Letters About Literature, which is a program developed by the Center for the Book more than 25 years ago, when kids uh, read and have, write letters to their favorite authors, living or dead, saying how that author's book helped shape their lives, especially their ways of thinking. And this has turned out to be a, for pro, a program for kids in grades four through uh, 12, 
And through the years, in the recent years, we've had averaged more than 50,000 letters a year uh, with different state centers as partners. I mentioned the Pavilion of States, and a number of people are here from the Pavilion. Once the letters come into the Library of Congress, uh, they are sent to the states, and the states, with a little help from us at our central office, choose, narrow down the possibilities for that state, and the states then uh, choose winners. And there are ceremonies and sponsors in the different states, and the variety of programs of books that are discussed, of course, is tremendous, and we have found it to be a wonderful way to work with the schools and interest them in literacy and in reading and in writing. And reading and writing go together in letters about literature. And we are privileged today to uh, have uh, actually three of the winners uh, from three different states who are going to share with us their winning letters. Uh, I mentioned that we've got over 50,000 students uh, in this year's uh, contest as well. Uh, many, many of these young writers uh, are extremely, uh, as you will find out from yourself, uh, for yourself, bright and energetic, but interested bringing of the letters, bringing themselves into connection with authors. And today we also have two of the authors who receive, receive the letters uh, to uh, hear from the students live. So this will be a uh, new experience at the National Book Festival, but we're very pleased to have two of the authors with us today whose books inspired such letters. Uh, they are uh, Cynthia Cahodata, winner of both the prestigious Newbery Medal and the National Book Award. Her no current novel is Half a World Away. The other author uh, is graphic novelist uh, Jean Luen Yang, whose work, American-born Chinese, was the first graphic novel to be nominated for a National Book Award and the first to win the American Library Association's Prince Award. It was also a winner of the 2007 Eisner Award, uh, and Jean's latest book is the two-volume Boxers and Saints. First, I'd like to call to the stage one of our winners, uh, Arden Franzen who is a state winner from Louisiana. She's from Lafayette, Louisiana. And she wrote to Cynthia about Cynthia's book, Kira Kira. Arden is here with her family. And she comes from a line, a long line of, of, fa of family letters about literature awards. And we find that the support for the program often comes from families and from teachers who delight in making part of the uh, their class or their family uh, a part of this program. So, and two of uh, Arden's siblings have also won Letters About Literature Awards. So please welcome Arden and the recipient of her letter, uh, Cynthia Katohara. Could they come to the stage? We're gonna bring a chair up here. Dear Cynthia Katohata, I am writing to you about your novel, Kira Kira. I found it in our school's library when I had to read a realistic fiction book for class. I liked Kira Kira because the back of the book's summary was catchy. Also, I liked the Japanese title and the way a picture of two girls standing side by side showed up when I opened the book all the way so I could see the front and back cover together. I didn't really know what realistic fiction was until I read your book. I thought it was just going to be a story about two sisters, but it was way more than that. In your book, the sisters Katie and Lynn wanted to go with their family to the beach because who doesn't want to go to the beach? It looked like Katie and Lynn would never get to go to the beach because they moved to places where they didn't really fit in and then Lynn got lymphoma. At first, I was really sad for Katie and Lynn because everything went wrong for them. K 
Katie started off mad because she felt like she would never get to the beach. Len, who should have been mad too that she would never make it to the beach because she was dying, was happy anyway. I learned from Len, just like Katie did, that there is Kira Kira, or glittering and shining things, all around us all the time. When Katie finally made it to the beach without Lynn, she saw Kira Kira at the beach, and she even heard it in the sounds of the waves. Just like Katie, I learned we get to choose what we see, and if we don't look for the Kira Kira, we will miss it and never know we had it. Miss Kat O'Hara, your book changed me because it is so much like my life right now. My grandfather and his brother, Poochie, who is my great uncle, are like Katie and Lynn. Poochie got very sick, just like Lynn. He is in the hospital with six months left to say his goodbyes. Every year, we saw Poochie at Thanksgiving and Christmas, but his grandchildren were not there because they live in faraway places like Brazil, where vacations don't happen at the same time ours do. All Poochie ever wanted was a family reunion at the beach to have all of our family together at the same time. They won't let kids my age go into, the, go into the hospital room where he is right now. If I could go and talk to him, I would tell him he shouldn't feel bad about not going to the beach. Life's not having to go somewhere to find the Kira Kira moments we already had. I hope we do get to the beach one day, but if we don't, we still have Kira Kira all around us every day if we look for it. And I'm happy about that. Thank you very much. Sincerely, Arden Franson. Our next letter was written by Christina Yang from Ch Ch Chantilly, Virginia. Uh, and it turns out that uh, Christina's sister also is a letter about literature's winner, and she is here. So we have another example of a family who's been very supportive of letters about literature, and we thank you for that. Uh, Christina wrote to Jean Luen Yang about his book, American Born Chinese, Please welcome both Christina and Jean to the stage. Jean. Hi, everyone, and thank you. Dear Jean Luen Yang, I am Chinese and I was born in America. To anyone else, this fact may seem obvious or of no importance to anyone else except for me. Before I found your book, I never truly accepted the fact that I am American, but born as a Chinese. It didn't matter where I was or who I was with, my identity never seemed to match up with who I really am. Your three intertwining stories in American-born Chinese show me something I had always been too afraid to accept in the past, that I am me no matter how I or anyone else may react to it. I was born in America, but China was all I knew since the age of four. In Beijing, I was a young Jing Wang, a content child who felt secure and safe with my peers. Back there, I was one of millions, even billions of people who looked and behaved in the same way I did. However, comfort zones disappear, even only to help you grow. When I was 10, my family moved back to the States. The skies are blue here, and there were trees everywhere. But after those few moments of excitement, I was jolted back to reality. People like me used to be everywhere. Now I am the special one. I was an out-of-place Chinese. I was a monkey king trying to fit in with the humans and Jing Wang with his American classmates. Everyone else looked so much cooler than me and had much more friends. My peers would tease me by my small eyes, good grades, and especially whatever was inside my lunchbox that day. I didn't want to be seen as chinky, the stereotypical Asian, but I was Chinese and that's it. 
Sometimes others would try to act kinder to the new girl, but I was awkward with the new culture, rules, and language. Even in my environment, the famous models, actresses, and singers are rarely ever my race. Commercials and billboards have beautiful girls with blonde hair and mine are black. Everywhere around me, the media and my friends' mostly negative portrayal of Asians shrunk my confidence. Because of my surroundings and doubt in myself, I tried forgetting my identity, just like my fellow travelers Jingling, Danny, and the Monkey King. I stopped writing out my last name, replacing with my initials. I stopped speaking Chinese at home, even ignoring certain traditional foods. Being me, being just a monkey, was enough anymore. I tried everything I can, and in a way, I succeeded. Gradually, I started to blend in. I was almost like any other teenager who needs her music and internet. I learned my disciplines on kung fu were better known slang and pop artists. I tried to dress and act like everyone else, but I had no way of changing my appearances, no matter how much I wish otherwise. But in a way, I changed like Jing Wang into the po a popular American jock Danny. My attitude changed and it showed inside out. Finally, I, gave, I gained friends and I gave all the credit to my thin mask. I thought I would feel comfortable and for a little bit, I lied to myself that I was fine the way I am. Maybe I was fine pretending, just like Danny. My lies were working until I started flipping through a book. Your characters and your stories were all looking for their identity, just like me. Like me, they were trying to fit into a society with their unique but rather awkward individuality. Just like me, they also thought the answer to popularity and the sense of belonging was a change of their identity. The Monkey King wanted to be human, and Jing Wen wanted to become Danny. After tough days at my new school, I will also dream of becoming that popular girl with blonde hair and blue eyes. But that wasn't the answer. A lie and a worthless dream didn't save me, but your book has. The answer seems so simple now, but it was difficult for me to turn from the way I was accustomed to. I had to realize there was something wrong with me, and finally something clicked when I saw my actions projected upon the more colorful characters of Monkey King and Jing Wang. I was too stupid to see what was wrong with me. I need your stories. I read carefully as a monkey king invaded a par dinner party for the gods and started a fight. Then he went home and criticized how dirty his monkey companions were. That was me, ignoring my culture when my pride was damaged. How fickle am I, changing who I am just because somebody didn't like it? Then Jing Wang had the nerve to ignore this Asian kid to impress others, but he just looked stupid. It was me again, building a see-through mask over myself. I realized how stupid I looked, trying to act like anyone but myself. I laughed when Jing Wang permed his hair to look like others until I looked at myself in the mirror. Who was I anymore? I tried curling my hair and getting rid of my tan. When I thought the characters in your book were acting stupidly, I criticized myself. Finally, when Tse Yao Zhao confronted the Monkey King, I just stared at the page. How could I have been so stupid? I believe in trusting God. Why would I be discontent with how he made me? I took off my rose-colored glasses and for the first time really looked at my situation. Was my race or culture really preventing me from being who I could be? Has being Chinese really affected my friendships or actions? What is wrong with being Chinese? I could be Chinese and be American. In fact, without my biased views on my life, I started seeing the benefits of being Chinese. I was proud of my Chinese heritage, one of the greatest of all time. I am proud of how I look, including my black hair and tan skin. I am proud of my traditions, especially Chinese food. I needed to find the rest of the answer to my problem. I did. Jing Wing asked Amelia out. She said, yes, that meant something to me. The fact that not everyone judges you based on your skin color. I have learned to stay myself no matter what. A true friend loves you who, for who you are inside and lucky enough to have a close circle of friends. In the next chomper, chapter, Wang Lai Tsao was rewarded, even though he was insignificant. He didn't try to fast, or preach, or meditate, but focus on what he was good at. Nothing could have been more direct. I don't need to dress stylishly or have blue eyes to do what I could do. In fact, good things come when you do your best with what you were given. I flipped through the book, imagining the scene where the Monkey King was finally free from his prison of 500 years. The answer is to stay yourself, but first humble yourself, then get out of your problems. The difficulties and hardships I see are only there because of me. The mountain on top of the Monkey King was his troubles, and the only way to get out was to shrink to who he was. He needed to be a monkey to get out. I needed to be me to get out of my prison. The lessons I learned from your book will not be forgotten easily. I saw myself in every page, every story, and every struggle. I was Jing Wang when he moved to a new school. I was Chinky when I met those popular kids at school. I was Danny at those times when I was a kid who didn't care about her identity. I was a monkey king, struggling to be something she would never become. 
I also see who I hope to be, someone who achieves her full potential, the monkey king who is finally willing to accept her identity and the talents that come with it. I would never understand how you were able to put my life into that book. Your book was my handbook in my journey. It pushed me enough to leave my comfort or discomfort zone. It took me through an entire trip, giving me hints and helping hands, and showed me the end where I wanted to go. I once was a girl who ran away from who she was, tripping over her feet while attempting the impossible. But I depended not too much on what others thought, not who I want to be. Thank you so much for showing me I can be whatever I want, even if I am a Chinese born in America. But I learn now. The Monkey King said, I would have saved myself for 500 years imprisonment beneath a mountain rock had I only realized how good it is to be a monkey. I would have saved myself nearly three years of bondage under my imagined chains had I only realized how good it is to be an American-born Chinese. Thank you for rescuing me before it's too late. Sincerely, Christine Wang. I'll just say a, a quick word. I think making comics is such a lonely business. I spend most of my hours by myself in a little room, and and uh, and hearing from readers like Christina makes all those lonely hours worth it. So thank you, thank you. Our final letters about literature winner is the national award winner for this year, uh, Rebecca, one of the three national award winners for this year, uh, Rebecca Miller from Wellesley, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. I love all of these states, but sometimes. Um, who wrote to Dr. Seuss about his book, One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish. Of course, Dr. Seuss is no longer with us, so she will be reading her letters solo. Uh, but just before we hear from Becky, I want to acknowledge the director of the Massachusetts Center for the Book, Sharon Shalo. Sharon is one of the longest running directors of a state center, and that center is one of the strongest in our 50-state network. Sharon is a tireless promoter of letters about literature, and students from Massachusetts are frequent winners. Please join me in thanking Sharon Shalo. So here in the front row. Now, now please welcome Rebecca Miller. Becky. Dear Dr. Seuss, when I was little, I remember reading One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish at night before I went to bed and being so absorbed in it I wouldn't put it down. It would leave me with such a great feeling I wouldn't want to stop reading. It was my favorite. Eventually though, my mom would come in and tell me to go to sleep and I always dreaded that point. I felt as if that visit was the moment my room came back to life and I bounced back to reality. But sadly, I don't get those visits anymore. About a month ago, my mother passed away with brain cancer. My mom always had a love of reading. She would read a 200-page novel in two hours if you let her. She could read on and on and on. Most of the books she read were trashy novels with no definite purpose except to entertain. But my mom would read me any book in the universe if I asked her to, simply because she wanted to share her love of reading with everyone. We read One Fish, Two Fish so many times I can't imagine how she didn't feel as if she had wrote it herself. With the funny pictures, the made up words, the voice, it made us both escape into a place we couldn't explain. It was wonderful and so exciting, it left me with a lasting impression of books I'll never forget. These memories were some I will always cherish. They connected me to my mom and I hope one day, if I have a family, I will share this memory with my kids and pass it on. I hope I will be just like my mother because these memories were some I shared with her. Once, when I was about eight years old, my mom and I cleaned out my bookshelf. It was overflowing with picture books, books I had gotten as presents, and the books my mom had saved since she was a little girl. We took every single book out and made three piles, the keep pile, the throw out pile, and the keep in the attic pile. I would take the books that no one read anymore, put them in the throw out pile, and as soon as my mom had seen what I had done, 
She'd say, no, we have to keep this one. Don't you remember reading this before? I'd say, Mom, I'm never going to read that. If you really want to keep it, put it in the attic pile. Pretty soon, the attic pile was by far the biggest one. We stored them up there, but they were soon long forgotten, isolated from small children's hands and eagerness to read for so long. I still have those attic books, but I haven't looked at them in forever. My mother cared way too much about the memories of reading books with my brother and I when we were kids to throw them away. She and I wanted to hold on to the happy past and the fun memories. I realized that I would be okay as long as I didn't let go of our time together, just like neither of us let go of our memories reading One Fish, Two Fish. One of the only books in the key pile was One Fish, Two Fish. It was the memory that made neither of us want to let it go. Whenever I miss my mom, I can read it and remember the way her voice sounded and how safe and warm we felt with each other, the way she'd fall asleep on my bed sometimes if we read late enough. Even if I can't be with her, I can still turn to what we both held on to. I'll always have that. Today was good. Today was fun. Tomorrow is another one. Dr. Seuss. Sincerely, Becky Miller. Thank you, Becky, and thank you to our other winners. Um, this does conclude our program. I want to thank not only the uh, winners of the various awards, I want to thank and recognize the winners of the, the Literacy Awards for the Library of Congress. I hope our program has demonstrated some of the different worlds that literacy represents and affects and how it has something to do with our lives at every level. And some of it is funny, some of it is sad, some of it is serious, dead serious in terms of what's happening in our world, but we're trying through our literacy events and programs and the new Library of Congress Literacy Awards uh, to develop a an, an meaningful program uh, that is going to help not only shape the world's and help the world's literacy problems, but use the Library of Congress and its prestige and its name and its role in the world uh, to forever expand and make a difference in the world of books and literacy. Thank you for joining us. Please thank again Dr. Billington and Mr. Rubenstein as well as our work. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.